The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Latinate Cognates on a rampage destroying gender, declension, and plundering the Roman imperial treasury in the bargain. Alt Universe meta heroes Martian Liftwood in seas of vast fortune. And welcome to The Future. Plus, part 42 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Happy New Year! Imagine we're one year closer to the future. The future. future, 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 future. This could be the year FTL is discovered, or time travel, or how about this? A way to digitally upload an author's arm so he can sign an ebook for you. It's crazy what could happen this year. And to start your 2014 off right, we continue our virtual fireside chat with legendary Bane author David Drake. We talk about Dave's early days and his new short story collection, Night and Demons. Night and Demons collects many of Dave's early stories, particularly the horror and dark fantasy tales. All the stories have great introductions by Dave, that really give a sense of how a young writer got his start and some of the fascinating people he met along the way. We'll talk to Dave in a moment, but first, the news. January titles are out of the gate, and this time you have a chance to win a trifecta by getting hold of all three. The third book in The Secret World Chronicles by Mercedes Lackey and a host of co-authors is out, and by a host of co-authors I mean three more, who are Veronica Jaguer, Cody Martin, and Dennis Lee. The title of the book is Revolution, and it's about superheroes fighting against nefarious forces, such as hidden cabals and evil masterminds. There's also lots of personal drama going on. If you like superhero comics and online games, this one's for you. Also up this month is Frank Chadwick's excellent sideways time travel steampunk novel, The Forever Engine. Frank posits a very cool world with a fairly plausible pseudoscience explanation. He throws a modern-day action-oriented guy back into that alternate past and sends him across Europe in a flying British warship lofted by a substance known as Liftwood. This one's really cool, and I had a lot to do with the editing of it. Now, the great thing about the Forever Engine is that Frank is one of the founders of Steampunk. Really, one of the founders. In addition to being an author, he is the creator of the board game Space 1889. He's also a key game creator in the Traveler universe, and the designer of excellent American Civil War game A House Divided. Finally, we have a new Ring of Fire book. This is 1636 Seas of Fortune by Ivor P. Cooper. Ivor takes the uptimers and their allies to the world's oceans and shows how the appearance of those folks from 2000 and their technology and values in 1632 Germany are changing Western America and Japan. It's a fascinating addition to Eric Flint's wonderful creation, the Ring of Fire series. All of these great new titles are now available at booksellers everywhere. It's going to be a great year, and Bain Books will be with you all the way. Here is part two of our virtual fireside chat with David Drake. We pick up where we left off, discussing Dave's early writing life and the stories in his new collection, Night and Demons. Let's let's leave Vietnam for, for a moment. You, you got... Going and writing after you got back, you got some perhaps lucky breaks in some of your own making in the in the seventies. Can you talk about um, some of your uh, some what you were doing in the mid seventies when your career started picking up speed, but you hadn't you hadn't quite taken off yet? How you got your agent, for instance, or, and met Jim Bay? <laughs> well, what I was doing in the seventies was I was assistant town attorney for the town of Chapel Hill. 
and it's writing on the side. But this is an important thing to remember. I had a day job throughout the 70s. Mm -hmm. I was editor for Whispers magazine, a, a small press run by Stu Schiff. And because I well. of this, I knew that um, Ramsey Campbell and uh, Brian Lumley were agented by a fellow in Minneapolis named Kirby McCauley. So when I saw a story by Brian Lumley, a, a clue mythos story by Brian Lumley in FNSF, uh, I thought, wow, he must have an agent to, to get, because FNSF famously hated mythos stuff. I'd certainly never been able to sell a fantasy to him. Well, I, you know, I had, but I did later, but, uh, and then, Ramsey Campbell had a story in a magazine called Haunt of Horror, uh, which was put out by the Marvel Comics people, a Digest magazine. Well, by the time I learned of the existence of Haunt of Horror, it had already been killed. So this guy, Kirby McCauley, had gotten two sales that I would have said was, were impossible for, you know, anybody to do. And I wrote him, but I, I thought I really needed a credential. So I was writing a story intending it for analog and with a Vietnam setting, by the way. And so when I finished it, I sent it off to Mr. McCauley and explained I intended to send it to Analog, and that I had written for August Derleth, and I would like to be agented by him. And he wrote back very nicely, uh, saying that um, he was familiar with my work from Arkham House, and had been intending to, to write me, as he had done a, a lot of Mr. Derleth's writers and that he would send it off to Analog, and he thought they'd like it. And he got a, an acceptance with a check by return mail, um, which, you know, pretty good introduction for both of us, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it certainly didn't have that happen very often after that. But um, that's how I met Kirby when he was an all-state insurance agent living in a base, it was a garage apartment in Minneapolis before he went off to New York City and starved for a bit. And I remember him writing that the, uh, the guy in the apartment below him was an agent too, kind of, for women. And I thought, okay, that tells me the kind of place he's living in. <laughs> but he got Stephen King as a client and got got and made uh, other people major writers. And um, I suddenly had the most powerful agent in New York City, particularly in the field, as my agent. That didn't exactly help me because I was still just writing short stories. I, I couldn't write a novel. I kept trying. But um, it, it certainly was a start. <laughs> As for Jim Bain, Kirby, did, I, I had written what became the, the first two Hammer stories and sent them off to Kirby, and he thought they were great. And he tried them here, and he tried them there, and everybody bounced them. Um, they as you may recall, were a lot harsher than most of what was being written at the time, and certainly most of what was being written in military SF at the time. It wasn't really a category of military SF, then, as a matter of fact. Um, but one of the places Kirby had sent them was Galaxy which was run by a total incompetent uh, named Valor Jacobson. And he'd rejected him. I don't mean he was incompetent because he rejected him. Um, 
but uh, when he was fired and replaced by his assistant, the assistant who'd recommended purchasing the stories, uh, called Kirby and got them back. The assistant was Jim Bain. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that was that was my first contact with Jim. And um, then when Jim was hired to run the science fiction portion of Ace Books when Tom Doherty took over, uh, Jim phoned Kirby again and said he wanted a collection of the Hammer stories. Now, Kirby had been trying to sell the Hammer stories, but everybody wanted them to be novelized. You know, and I frankly think that's a terrible idea, and I've seen it done often enough to say that. Um, but in any case, I wasn't going to do it. Mm-hmm. But Jim just wanted a collection. So that was my first book sale, was the uh, collection to Jim Bain. I had to write half of the material, because <laughs> the total of the stories, including the three that Jim had bought and the two he had rejected, was only half a book, even as books were it then. And... Um, Jim, uh, you know, I, I wrote more material for it. But there the book was as a collection of short stories, and I was I was paid $2,500 for it. And because Ace Books was, by the time it came out, um, on its last legs and was doing some very odd accounting things, um, it was years before I realized that it had actually been a tremendous bestseller. I had no idea. Uh, it, for a collection by a new writer, which came out in the middle of a long list, I think it was an 11-book list, and I think it was the eighth in the list um, in 1979. Uh, but it sold 300,000 copies. Now, not bad. That's nothing that the uh, royalty statements would have led me to believe. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I did uh, learn it later. Yeah, creative bookkeeper is always a problem. <laughs> yes. Well, you—I mean—that you sort of hit your stride at that at that time. When did you quit being a lawyer and and start writing full time? Well, uh, those are two separate questions. I quit lawyering in 1980 and got a job driving a city bus. And to my utter astonishment, my writing career took off. And um, I quit driving a bus the next year. So I became a full-time freelance writer in 1981 of a number of good things happened in 1980, though it didn't feel very good at the time. Um, the Because Hammer's Flammers had been a tremendous success, a number of people wanted books from me. And because I didn't know it had been a tremendous success, <laughs> the sales forces of various companies knew, but I didn't. Somebody knew, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... Well, you know, frankly, the fact I was ignorant was probably as good luck as the fact the book had done well, because I'm human. I mean, I'd I'd like to think I'm more solidly grounded than a lot of writers are, but if I'd been told, oh, you hit that one out of the park, you're great, I would have started thinking I was great, and... um, that w- wouldn't have been good for me, and I, God knows I've seen enough writers, so have you, I dare say. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not saying I'm I'm smarter or better than those, but I will say that by being ignorant, I was saved from having 
to worry about an inflated self-opinion. Um, I really didn't intend to become a full-time writer. I mean, I never intended that. Um, but lawyering, it was 10 years after I got back from Nam, but I, I basically quit lawyering. It was killing me. Uh, everybody you're around as a lawyer is either pissed off or miserable. And I was having enough trouble with my head anyway. Uh, I started sort of coming up from her. I'd been just putting one foot in front of the other for 10 years. And I got through law school, um, you know, and I, I functioned as assistant town attorney. But I wasn't thinking much about anything. And when I got to the point I could think, I stopped doing that, stopped doing the lawyering. And because I knew that, you know, you can't make a living as a full-time writer, I got a part-time job driving a city bus. And that gave me time to write more, but it wasn't so that I could write more. I, I needed the money. Um, I'd made in the two previous years, I'd made about $6,000 a year from my writing on top of the lawyering. And I figured that I could reasonably expect to get $5,000 uh, a year from my writing since I would be doing a little more of it. And I would be making something I I figured five. It was actually sixty one hundred um, from driving a bus, and my wife had a part time job uh, teaching uh, kindergarten half days. So among those three things, three sources of income, we had an income of fifteen thousand dollars, and that wasn't a fortune even in nineteen eighty. But we had a very cheap mortgage on the house. And uh, I figured we could make it. And I wasn't going to make it if I had to keep lawyering. So you had to get out of that. And the writing uh, writing came after that because it became the thing that uh, that more and more paid your bills. Yeah. I, I mean, my first year is a – my first year as a part-time bus driver, uh, I made more writing – than I had as a lawyer the year before. And no one in his right mind would have predicted that. I certainly wouldn't have. Uh, I had both my agent and Carl Wagner, who had been a full-time writer for a decade by then, and was a close friend. Uh, both of them were telling me, uh, after I said I was quitting lawyering, they, they both called to tell me, no, no, don't do that. Uh, Keep your keep the lawyering job. But it's impossible to make a living as a writer now. Well, I wasn't trying to make a living as a writer, but in fact, they were wrong. I did. Uh, damn this thing. I mean, I I, I am very lucky. Um, on the other hand, if I hadn't been sent to Nam, I probably wouldn't have a career. And I don't consider that good luck. Hank, do you consider it good luck for you? No, not really. Yeah. I, I wasn't Same doing thing it. basically wasn't... happened to Hank as happened to me. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't doing any serious writing. So it wasn't really an interruption of that. Yeah. Well, I, I found I had to write to keep myself between the ditches. I wasn't consciously aware of what I was doing. But that's the truth of it. Well, you mentioned Carl Edward Wagner. Um, tell us a, a bit about your uh, your your coterie, your friends, <laughs> we should say, yeah. um, at of at the time. Um, yeah. Uh, Carl Wagner, Manley, Wade Wellman, etc. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. How did you meet these guys, and what did they uh, what do they mean to you as a writer? Um. Carl had become close friends. Carl had come to 
UNC med school. And he had come to UNC in part uh, because Manley did live here, and Carl was a great fan of pulp writing and of Manley. Uh, Manley had been a, he'd sold his first story back in about 1925 and had been a mainstay of the pulps and then later uh, in the 40s of the comic industry. But I had read a great deal. Uh, he, he was, during the time, um, oh, blocking on his name, um, Hank helped me, the spirit. Oh, William Eisner? Well, well, uh, yeah. While Eisner was in the military, uh, Manley was scripting quite a lot of the spirit comics, but quite a lot of other things as well. Um, Manley was unable to get into the military. Uh, age, weight, and blood pressure. Kept trying. Um, so did my dad, who was, uh, you know, had really bad astigmatism, and he couldn't get in either. But um, they, Carl had come to Chapel Hill and become close friends with Manley. Uh, one of the guys I went through language school and wound up in uh, part of a six-man unit in Cambodia with, uh, Larry Barnhouse, had been Carl's classmate at Kenyon. So after Larry got out of the military, <laughs> Larry had been drafted out of... Um, he was getting a zoology degree at the University of Chicago. Um, talk about your best and your brightest. I, mean, <laughs> I think McNamara did a pretty good job of getting us and sending us to Nam. Um, but Larry visited Carl, and um, they phoned and invited me to come over for dinner, and that's how I met Carl. And I had met Manley before I was shipped off to Nam. Um, I, I had made a point of just visiting him in his office in Chapel Hill uh, with the, the conscious thought that if I get blown away in Nam and I haven't said hello to this wonderful, wonderful writer whom I've been reading since I was 13, I'm going to feel like a real damn fool. Um, <laughs> so I had met Manley before um, I got to know him through Carl, but I got to know him through Carl much better. And we were friends. I mean, we weren't <clears throat> we we weren't a writing group or anything like that. We were just friends who wrote, and that gave us something in common. We get together for dinner. And we'd talk about things, and we'd talk about markets, and sometimes we'd read stories to one another, you know, the latest thing. Uh, but mostly we were just friends, and it, it was really a good thing to know other people who were facing the same sorts of situations uh, in slightly different fashions. Uh, Carl and I were new to the business. Uh, Manly was really an old pro, but he had gotten out of writing fantasy, and he got back into it at the same time that Carl and I were getting into it, and that's in part because we were getting into it, and he dusted off the old skills, and um, it's just, it's good to have friends, and it's, it's good to have, I learned a lot about pulp magazines, pulp fiction, from Carl, and I learned about the life of a writer from them, <clears throat> because he'd been a full-time writer since 1939, really. Uh, he, he would occasionally teach classes and this sort of thing, but that was because he liked to help young writers. It was, it was never a significant part of his income. He had twice refused to be writer-in-residence which is a sinecure, of course, uh, at a university because he didn't want to be beholden to a um, to somebody else's rules. 
So he, he taught in evening colleges and this sort of thing, taught at Elon, which <laughs> is the uh, Elon University is a big deal now, but trust me, it wasn't in the 50s, 60s when Manley was there. Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> a well known little liberal arts college here in North Carolina, is it not? Uh, it, yeah, it, it is now. And as I say, it's even rather major, major now. Mm -hmm. But um, that's where my son went, as a matter of fact. Ah. But um, it it was basically a small place where a man like Manley, with his stature as a writer, could have the room to do it the way he wanted to do it without answering to anybody else. Uh, they were glad to have him, and he was glad to have students who wanted to write. It's really about that simple. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, kind of time travel ghost story in, in Night and Demons, The Waiting Bullet, uh, ah. <laughs> which seems to have been directly inspired by uh, by at least Wellman's uh, cabin that he had in the in the Smokies or, or in the... Uh, uh, yeah, the cabin, and indeed, quite a lot... Um, <laughs> Quite a lot in Madison County, in, including the Bourbon Supreme at a uh, dollar over a pint of Bourbon Supreme at four dollars and fifty cents in a plain bag, uh, bootleg, in um, a little store north of Marshall in Madison County. Madison County was dry, uh, but you could buy uh, liquor uh, illegally. Mm -hmm. However, it wasn't white liquor. It wasn't um, moonshine, if you will. Uh, it was simply ordinary liquor that had been bought in another county and was being sold under the counter in uh, Madison. So, I mean, that all of that is quite real. I mean, the whole, the whole thing, um, indeed, the, the feud <laughs> that's described there is all quite real. Uh, Yes, the fantasy, but um, I really, I really did try to get the feel of the place when I was doing it, and um, yeah, the the atmosphere of that story is is just wonderful. Um, the I mean, you catch the uh, that that Appalachians feel. <laughs> I mean, it's about moonshiners, for God's sake. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> I, I, when I say that uh, the Bourbon Supreme wasn't moonshine, yes, that's exactly right. Of course there was a lot of white liquor made in Madison County. <laughs> the book is Night and Demons, a collection of the very best horror and dark fantasy stories of David Drake. It's out now at booksellers everywhere. Dave, thanks so much for, for being with us today. And good to talk with you and, and Hank. Yep. Good to and talk you all with you, Dave. There. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has entered into a simmering, low-level conflict with the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the verge, a region at the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the verge, Brutal tactics and puppet dictatorships are par for the course for the OFS. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OFS without outside aid. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Goldpeak, commands the RMN forces in the nearby Talbot Quadrant. Goldpeak is sympathetic to the rebels, but is looking for the right place to strike a blow on their behalf. In the Mobius system, Solly Ground and Space Forces have arrived to put down rebellion against the Solarian puppet government. 
but the tables are turned when Royal Manticoran Navy Commodore Sir Ivers Terikov shows up with a sizable detachment of Gold Peak's fleet. The overmatched Solly Picket Force is given its chance to surrender, and if they don't, Terikov is about to show the Sollies that the Royal Manticoran Navy has every intention of coming to the aid of the Mobius System rebels. Here is Part 42 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Brigadier Francisca Usel took another quick angry turn around the luxurious office she'd been assigned in the Lombroso Arms Tower. The Lombroso Arms was across President Lombroso's boulevard from the Presidential Palace, and its thick ceramicrete walls made it virtually impervious to anything the rebels had been equipped with when she first arrived. It also gave her a commanding height as an observation post and a ground-based communication station. Her office was huge, lavishly decorated, with floor-to-ceiling windows that looked directly down on the roof and ornate facade of the presidential palace. She'd enjoyed its comfort since her arrival, and her communications section had set up along with the rest of her staff in the larger office suite next door. Her lofty perch had let her oversee the systematic destruction of the scum who'd been about to kick Lombroso's worthless ass before she arrived, and she'd felt nothing but satisfaction as the effort progressed. She probably could have finished it sooner, but she wanted to be sure these worthless proles never forgot, that they never again dared to think of raising their hands to frontier security or its allies. Only now, the fucking mantis had turned up, and that worthless asshole Watson hadn't even tried to stop them. He'd just rolled over and blown up his own ships, so the Mantis didn't even have to waste any missiles on them. One of these days, she'd settle his cowardly ass the way it deserved to be settled. But for now, she had to deal with the goddamned Mantis. You didn't believe it, did you? She asked herself viciously. Didn't want to. Wang did, damn him, but not you. You knew better. She snarled, burying the fear she didn't want to admit under fresh anger. They hadn't had anything to go on, really. A couple of hints from interrogation. Nothing concrete, and God knew the lying bastards would say anything, invent anything, if they thought it was going to keep somebody they cared for alive. Admit it, she told herself. You did believe the Mantis were involved. It just never occurred to you they might be this involved. You figured you had plenty of time to settle these fuckers' hash before anyone back in Spindle even knew you were here. Jerk their goddamned rebels out from under their feet, and they wouldn't have any spontaneous uprising to support. But you didn't have time, did you? No, she hadn't. And she gritted her teeth as she remembered how positive she'd been that the Mantis would back down that even they had to realize taking on the Solarian League was nothing more than glorified suicide. Obviously, they were even stupider than she'd thought, and even now she took a grim, vengeful satisfaction from the thought of what this was going to cost them in the end. They'd pay one day, pay in spades, for everything they'd done, for all their treachery and deceit. But this wasn't one day. This was today. And today the Mantis were sitting up there in orbit, and they hadn't even tried to talk to her or that idiot Lombroso yet. They were just sitting there, letting her sit down here and rot. But it wasn't going to work. She had their fucking number. If they thought they were going to waltz in here and— Excuse me, ma'am. What? She snarled, wheeling around to face the Mobian communications tech who dared to enter her office. There's someone on the comm asking for you, ma'am. The presidential guard tech said nervously, sweat beating his forehead. He says he's somebody named Terikov? Commodore Terikov. Oh, he does, does he? Yusel felt her lips twist in anger. Terikov, the same son of a bitch who'd shot up the Monica system and started this whole friggin' nightmare. She should have guessed. The Mobian only stood there looking at her, obviously uncertain whether he was supposed to answer or not, and terrified to make the wrong choice. Her fingers flexed with the urge to rip his head off, but she made herself draw a deep breath instead. All right, put him on my desk display. Yes, ma'am. 
The tech disappeared like smoke, and Usul turned towards the office's enormous desk just as the display lit with the face of a blonde, blue-eyed officer in the black and gold of the Royal Manticoran Navy. What? she snapped. I assume I have the dubious privilege of addressing Brigadier Usul. The contempt in Tarakov's tone flicked Usul like a whip. I'm Usul, she confirmed in a harsh, hard-edged voice. What the fuck do you want? I thought, much as the idea disgusts me, that I might offer you a chance to get off this planet alive. Tarakov's voice was like ice, his expression one of indifference. Personally, I'd prefer to kill you where you stand. I've had the opportunity to observe your handiwork in some detail. However, since we're all civilized people here, I decided to give you my terms first. Your terms? she sneered. Who the hell do you think you are? You come waltzing into this star system, you attack Navy starships, and now you have the sheer unmitigated gall to tell me you're going to offer me terms? Well, fuck you! One of us is here at the invitation of the legally constituted government of this star system, Commodore Terakov, and it sure as hell isn't you. A legally constituted government that's massacred or allowed you to massacre a half million or so of its citizens with kinetic strikes? That legally constituted government? What a sovereign star nation does to suppress criminal insurrection is none of your goddamned business, she said harshly. And what the Solarian Gendarmerie does at the request of that sovereign star nation is none of your business either. So get your ships the hell out of this system. Not going to happen. Terakov's calm, cold precision was a sharp contrast to the seething fury of her own tone. To put this in terms even you may be able to understand, Brigadier, you're screwed. I don't care if we have to kill every single gendarme down there, and I certainly don't care if we have to kill you. But I'd just as soon avoid any additional damage to the Mobian's planet if I can. So, here are those terms. You lay down your weapons. You march all of your personnel out of landing to a point to be designated by me, and you wait there until my marines take you into custody. And then what happens in this fantasy of yours? She demanded. You shoot us all on the spot? I'll admit the thought has a certain appeal, he said. But no. We take you into custody, and we keep you there until a proper court can be convened to consider the actions of your personnel on this planet. All of you will receive a fair trial, and the guilty will receive the sentence commensurate with their crimes. You're out of your fucking mind. Yusel's voice was almost conversational. You really think you're going to get away with trying and shooting Solarian gendarmes? I was thinking more in terms of hanging, actually, since that seems to be your own favorite form of execution, but we'll probably leave that up to the Mobians, he told her, and she barked a scornful laugh. And <laughs> just what the hell do you think is going to happen to your pissant little star empire when the League finds out about that? She demanded. I'll cross that bridge when I get to it, he told her flatly. Not that I'm particularly worried about it in the short term. You may have kicked Crantle's ass at Spindle, but it's going to be different when the Navy knows what you've got and comes after you, she spat. You obviously haven't paid any attention to reality in some time, Terakov said. And you're just a bit behind the news, too. For example, on the basis of what you've just said, I don't suppose you've heard about what happened to Vice Admiral Dabroskaya at Saltash, when five of our destroyers destroyed all four of her battle cruisers, or about the fact that the Star Empire is now allied to the Republic of Haven, or that between us, we now have somewhere around five hundred ships of the wall any two of which could have controlled every missile we fired at Crandall and Spindle. Let's do some math here, Brigadier. If two of our ships can kill seventy of yours, and we've got five hundred of them, that means we can kill every super dreadnought in Battlefleet, including the reserve, about three times each. He paused, smiling coldly at her, letting her see the total confidence in his eyes, then continued. 
According to the latest dispatches before I headed out for Mobius, your Admiral Filaretta was on his way to Manticore with somewhere around four hundred of the wall. By this time, I'm sure he's arrived, and if he was foolish enough to actually fight when he got there, I doubt any of his ships lasted long enough to surrender. I'm certainly not worried about the outcome anyway. Now, do you accept my terms or not? Yusil stared at him, her face momentarily slack with shock. Manticor and Haven allied? Allied against the Solarian League? He was lying. He had to be lying. But even as she thought that, something with thousands of icy little feet started crawling up and down her spine. If he wasn't lying, if he was telling the truth, that would explain why he'd been willing to take out Watson's ships— and if he really was ready to do what he'd just said he'd do to her personnel, to her, the ice moving up and down her back seemed to settle in her belly. It was odd. She'd never realized her stomach could be simultaneously nauseated and frozen into a solid lump. Panic surged suddenly, rising into her throat like vomit, and she swallowed hard. For a moment, she knew exactly what it had felt like for countless malcontents and troublemakers when her gendarme's pulsar butts hammered on their doors. But then she forced herself to push the panic aside and glared at Terakov's image. All right, she said. Those are your terms. Well, here are mine. You stay the hell off this planet. You put one shuttle down here, one friggin' marine, and I start shooting prisoners. I've got over 30,000 of them in the stadium— you're welcome to take a look for yourself. And I've got two companies of gendarmes over there. I can kill every fucking person in that stadium in five minutes flat. And if you try any shit like landing on this planet, I swear to God I will. Courageous and determined to serve and protect to the last, I see. Terakov observed contemptuously, and Yusel flushed as he tossed the Solarian gendarmerie's official motto into her teeth. Just try me and see, she snarled through gritted teeth. One more time, Brigadier, and my patience isn't unlimited. If you choose not to accept the terms offered, the consequences will be on your own head. What? You think I believe you'd come down here after me? Wreck the rest of this podunk city coming after my people and get everybody in the friggin' stadium killed? She sneered at him. Not you. You've got to be the goddamned white knight in shining armor. Well, you come down here and screw around with us, and you'll get plenty of blood on that armor, I guarantee it. I see. Perhaps I should be having this conversation with President Lombroso. He might be perfectly willing to hand you and your gendarmes over to me, if he thought it would save his own skin. Lombroso couldn't hand you candy from a baby. He's hiding in the damn basement, him and Hadley both. He deputized me to negotiate with you, and I'm all done, friend. Now, are you going to accept my terms, or do I need to pass the order to shoot the first hundred or so prisoners to make my point? Why is it, Terakov asked conversationally, that people like you always think you're more ruthless than people like me? Something about his tone rang warning bells in the back of Yusel's brain, but she refused to look away. She held her glare locked on him, refusing to back down, and he shrugged. Stilt, he said without glancing away from Yusel. Yes, sir, a voice replied from outside his comp pickup's field of view. Pass the word to Colonel Simak, then set condition Zeus. Condition Zeus, aye, aye, sir. What the hell are you talking about? Yusil snapped. I can't say it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Brigadier. Terakov replied. Educational, yes, in a disgusting sort of way, but not a pleasure. In fact, I'm just as happy we won't be speaking again. Good, she said. Now get the fuck out of here before I change my mind and decide to shoot a couple of dozen of them to hurry you on your way. Oh, I'm not afraid of that, he assured her. In fact, he raised his wrist and glanced at his personal chrono. 
you should be receiving my response to your terms. Those ice-blue eyes flicked back to her face. Just about now. She frowned, wondering what the hell he was talking about. She was still wondering two and a half seconds later when the kinetic projectile struck Lombroso Arms Tower at approximately 30 kilometers per second. The Mark 87 Damocles Kinetic Strike Package was a containerized weapon system designed to fit into any standard shipboard magazine and sized to deploy through a counter-missile launch tube. The KSP could be configured with several different types of payloads, but the most common variant, like the one which had been deployed from Quentin St. James No. 3 CM tube shortly after she'd entered orbit, carried a rack of six of the Royal Manticoran Marine Corps' M412 kinetic penetrators. Each penetrator was a 650-kilogram dart fitted with its own small, short-lived but powerful impeller drive, a capacitor ring for onboard power, and a guidance package. By controlling acceleration rates and times, the M412 could produce an effective yield of up to one megaton, but this particular application called for a slightly smaller sledgehammer than that. The projectile impacted at barely one-tenth of a percent of light speed. The tower was enormous, the projectile wasn't all that huge, and its velocity might seem snail-like compared to the 80% of light speed a Mark 23 could attain, but it was sufficient. In fact, it produced an effective yield of just over 67 kilotons as it struck dead center on the tower's roof at an angle of exactly 90 degrees and punched straight down, hitting it with a spike of plasma that vaporized everything in its path. Admittedly, the results were positively anemic compared to those of the far heavier strikes Usul had used to obliterate rebellious towns as object lessons, but that suited Ivar's Terakov just fine. The structure's massive ceramicrete walls confined and channeled the blast, and the towers around the impact point acted as cofferdams, further confining the blast and restricting the damage. Yet the explosion still reached out to obliterate the presidential palace and everything else, including the residential towers in which the System Unity and Progress Party's leadership and the majority of the Transteller's off-world personnel had been quartered, in a three-block radius. Within the primary zone of destruction, virtually nothing survived. Outside it, except for shock damage, there was remarkably little devastation. Even as the shock wave rolled outward from what had been the Lombroso Arms Tower, two dozen assault shuttles plummeted out of landing sky. Eight of them swooped down on the soccer stadium, heavy with wing-mounted precision-guided munitions that launched and screamed in on the tri-barrels useless gendarmes had mounted on the stadium's uppermost row of bleachers to cover the prisoners below. Precisely calculated fireballs crushed them like some giant's brimstone boots, and the shuttles reefed back around, going into hover, dropping their noses to bring their bow-mounted heavy cannon to bear. The rest of the shuttles streaked by overhead, and three companies of battle-armored Manticoran marines plummeted from them on countergrav drop harnesses. Here and there, an isolated gendarme or two had survived the PGM strike, with enough courage, or stupidity, to fire on the hovering shuttles or try to nail one of the plummeting marines, they didn't have much luck. The Marines came in far too hard and fast to be easily targeted by men and women terrified of what was happening, and the gendarmes had no anti-air weapons. The Mobius Liberation Front hadn't had any aircraft for them to worry about, so none had been issued to the stadium guards, and the shuttles were too well armored for their surviving light weapons to pose any threat. Those far enough away from any prisoner discovered that their body armor was worth precisely nothing when a 30-millimeter round from a shuttle pulse cannon hit them at several thousand meters per second. The others lasted a little longer, until the Marines grounded, and they discovered that their pulse rifles were as useless against battle armor as they'd been against the shuttles. A handful threw their weapons to the ground and got their hands clasped behind their heads quickly enough to survive. Helen Zilwicky stood behind Commodore Terakov, watching the recon platform's imagery in the main visual display. The kinetic strike's towering, ugly, anvil-headed cloud of dust and smoke was still climbing when the first Marine landed. The prevailing wind had barely begun to bend it before the entire stadium had been secured. The sheer stunning speed of it left her feeling vaguely dazed. 
she'd been at Tarakov's elbow as he, Commander Lewis, and Colonel Simak planned and organized Zeus. Yet she'd been convinced somehow that Usel was at least smart enough to realize how hopeless her position was. I guess Daddy was right when he told me to never underestimate the power of human stupidity, she thought. God, I hope the word gets around and finally starts penetrating even Solly's skulls. If we have to keep on killing every damn one of them. Well, Terakov said after a moment, blue eyes still on the visual display. I suppose we should see if whoever's still alive in their chain of command is more willing to listen to reason. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 42, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Christopher Chifani, and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a single self-oxidizing candle lit in the space between Saul and Alpha Centauri to mark our gratitude to David Drake, author of New Horror and Dark Fantasy Collection, Night and Demons. Happy New Year once again, and please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And in 2014 and beyond, keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.